Hey, welcome to Reading Romans with the Reardons. I'm Curtis. And I'm Chrisula. And we are the Reardons. Uh, we're going to be reading through uh, a chapter at a time and kind of giving a, a little commentary on some thoughts and things that we have as we go. But before we get started, uh, we wanted to introduce ourselves. Um, I work as a youth pastor, essentially a director of student and young adult ministries at Faith Reformed Church. Long title. Yeah. Amazing results. <laughs> and I am a special ed teacher at a middle school. And we have never done a podcast before, but we uh, had this idea. I think it was my idea, actually. Yeah. All the good ideas in this relationship come from me. Maybe. Maybe. Probably. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we have no idea if we're good at this, but we're just going to try it out. This is our first podcast ever. Um, we're going to just read through all of Romans, um, every other paragraph, and then we have some little thoughts that we're going to share after we read through the whole thing. So... Here we go, Romans 1. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to his holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his Son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles, For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach the good news. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, he can clearly... They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, They worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. 
So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So now we're going to jump back to the very beginning, to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Um, it starts out saying that this letter is from Paul. Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. Most of the New Testament are letters written from him, and he has a definite style of writing, um, and he gets pretty fancy and flowery and technical in some things. And as we'll, we'll be reading, we'll see some paragraphs that are all one single sentence too and it gets kind of long but we'll we'll try to make good sense of it as we go Paul is well known he's writing these letters and the churches are getting these letters and they've heard about Paul he is a figure then but he says right off the bat my title what I want to be known as who I am I'm Paul and I am a slave of Christ Jesus. And that is the honorary title that he gives himself. He just says he's a simple servant. And that is what he aspires to be, essentially. So that is that is a, a cool thing there right off the bat. Mm-hmm. I also love how he says he's, he's the slave of Christ uh, to be an apostle and sent out to preach the good news that this word good news that he uses is that's the gospel. It's the good news about Jesus Christ. I, I love this phrase. And I could talk about this for a while, but we'll just say here that Paul's so excited about it and loves it too, that he just comes out in verse one and starts telling them like, here's the good news. This is what it's about. And we're not even done with the opening of the letter. And then in verse 4, where it says, He was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. That just stuck out to me right off the bat because like everything about Christianity hinges on the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he wasn't just crucified and died, but that he was actually um, resurrected. And like that, that is the, the, the biggest piece of Christianity. So I love that he just points that out too. Let's see, in verse 7, uh, he says that he's writing to all of you in Rome, uh, that this letter was initially written to the people of Rome, but it still has things for us to learn from. It still applies to us today. Um, there's a different context and things, but uh, even even then, the le- Paul would have written this letter to the people of Rome, the church in Rome, and they would have passed it around to other churches, and it would have been used to support and encourage and direct the the churches then, too. And then I want to point out in verse 12, well, can we tell who's more the academic with the uh, theology and background on the studies? You're doing a great job. I don't. I don't have the same knowledge that Curtis does, but... Anyways, on verse 12, um, it says, When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. Well, I just think that's super cool, one, because like Paul was like the leader of the early church and wrote so much in the New Testament, like you said, but he still needed encouragement in his faith. And I know 
for me, we have a connection to an orphanage down in Mexico, and uh, I've been going there for the last 15 years, and it's been a huge encouragement to go down there, and like we bring encouragement to them, and then, but then while we're down there, we are always so encouraged in our faith um, when we come mm-hmm. back, yeah. and then, I mean, even with that, personally, when when I am just feeling far away from God or what, and I need encouragement, I know that I, I can, I, I rely on the other, the faith of the other people around me or, or the stories of faith. I know that, um, Ilario, the leader of the orphanage in Mexico, he just has a miraculous story of God, um, calling him and taking him, um, out of prison even. So sometimes when I'm feeling dry in my faith, that that is something that can really, um, help me and impact me. In verse 16, um, he talks about how he's not ashamed of this good news about Christ um, and other powerful verses in this paragraph here. Uh, and yeah, that's just the, the good news coming up again and him getting ex- excited about it again, that this good news is is worth having your life your life changed for and it's worth sharing with others. Then later down in um, verse 17, it talks about being the good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. And that phrase, I just love that phrase. That's so beautiful to think about us being in God's sight. He is so good. He is loving. He is the creator. He's so powerful and, and just, but to be in his sight like we are sinful and not holy and we can't be in God's presence but because of this good news like this is why it's good news because of Jesus Christ we can be in God's sight and God is not going to uh strike us down or anything that God we can be in God's sight and that can be good and pleasing it's a beautiful and wholesome thing to be with God and God be pleased. I think of that like we have a, a an almost 11 month old son and just to see how he is right in your Curtis's in your eyes and how beautiful it is to see that relationship and that wholesomeness um, and kind of comparing what that means like for us to be made right in God's sight like you take so much joy in Ezra like mm-hmm. it's just crazy and thinking how much joy um, we are to God as his children. Um, it's just like beautiful. Yeah. Knowing that he, our, our son does not do everything right. He is sinful and messes up, but that there is still beauty and relationship in there Mm. because we can be reconciled. Yeah. Um, so then he, Paul goes on to say, uh, that this good news, this being made right in God's sight, it's finished, it's accomplished by faith in Jesus Christ, by accepting this gospel, this good news. Um, It's through faith. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's also nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. He simply loves you. That was one thing that I learned from another pastor at another church that has just stuck with me for a while that it's not based on how perfect of a life we can live. We don't need to compare ourselves to others or work super hard and be hoping for that and hoping that we're good enough. Mm -hmm. It being faith that saves us and just being Jesus Christ that saves us, no work of our own, that frees us then to live the best life we can out of thankfulness instead of obligation and the need to be saved. And we can thank God that he saved us. Yeah. Um, switching gears over to verse 20 where it says, um, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature. I think about that so much. I, I just like, I see God's handiwork everywhere. And, and especially 
uh, in nature. And a few years ago, I think we got in the habit of like, we'd be driving home, um, especially when we lived in a super urban area and we'd like come around the corner on the freeway and we could just see like the mountains with the sun hitting it and the pink glow and the clouds behind it. And it was just like, oh my gosh, that's so gorgeous. (laughs) And it was so beautiful. And we actually got in the habit of just saying out loud, thank you, Lord, for your beautiful creation, or thank you, Lord, for this masterpiece you drew for us tonight, or just, just really recognizing that he is the creator. He made it all, and that's it's his work on it. Um, that's also encouraging to me in my faith, too. When God doesn't seem super tangible, I'm like, there's all these amazing tangible things out here, and or listening to like a Louis Giglio about how big the universe is and beyond that, and then like thinking about microscopes and how small the detail on insects is and just incredible things like that. And I I would agree. I'd say that the times that I feel most close to God, most connected with him or most in awe of God is when I am looking at nature or I am Mm -hmm. immersed in nature and surrounded by it and get to be quiet and look at it. Yeah. I agree. Um, Verse 25 just has a phrase that just is always in the back of my mind. They traded the truth about God for a lie. Um, And I think about that, that it's so easy to listen to lies. Um, We have lies that come from within. We have lies that come from out. It's just so easy to trade in God's truth for a lie. And they, they can't be true at the same time. That's that's what's um, so grounding in being in God's word and being in fellowship with him and the Holy Spirit is to know that those lies that we're hearing can't also, like they can't be true at the same time that what God says is true. Reminds me of that Lauren Daigle song, Who You, Who you Say I Am, right? Mm. Yeah. What comes to mind when I think about the uh, trading the truth about God for a lie is that that is kind of what he was talking about just in the paragraph before that about making an idol of things it's it's the truth about god like god is god and then creating this lie this idol being like no i i'm i like this instead i like this better this seems right this is this is my god um and that trading god's truth for a lie is what is essentially at the heart and foundation of of all sin. That's kind of how it it all starts. Yeah. Um, I wanted to point out in verse 28, it has a little phrase where it says, he let them do the things, blah, blah, blah. Um, I struggle sometimes with the free will that God gives us. Um, So many times I just want him to like grab people and make it so obvious that he loves them. Um, but that's not love to force somebody into relationship like that. And, and I get it, but it's just like frustrating to me, but he free, I mean, he freely offers himself for us, which means that he freely lets us accept him or not. Um, which I like, I get rationally, but emotionally sometimes I'm just like, God, just grab us all. But I get it. It's just hard for me to swallow sometimes. Uh, in verse 30, uh, he talks about uh, they invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. Being a, a parent for almost 11 months now, I, I totally see that is uh, very important. <laughs> um, disobeying parents is just right up there with the worst of those things. <laughs> and Ezra needs to definitely work on that commandment to honor his father and mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm excited for Father's Day next year. We just had it, but it'll roll around again. Uh, so this is not the the most cheery of ends to a chapter. Um, <laughs> the last sentence starts out, worse yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... The uh, Paul did not intend for people to stop reading here at uh, at this point. The chapter numbers were not put in until way later. Um, but this is where we're going to stop because uh, that's what we decided to do. And 
But that's just an easy place to stop for now, and we'll wait until another time for chapter two. Sounds good. Well, and I just want to end, too, with this encouragement um, to all of you. In a world with opinions, with hard news, um, with just difficult things to hear all the time, it seems like um, join us in leaning into God's truth and into his word, kind of with that exchanging God's truth for a lie. Um, like there's nothing more grounding than just reading God's word and, and letting um, that truth be the thing that resonates in our hearts. And uh, my encouragement is just going to be a mic drop of two words. Good news. Poof. <laughs>